Okay, looks like we're recording. Here we go. So uh, last time uh, we uh, we finished section 1.6, so three pages of the chapter one notes. In my defense, we also did two pages of the uh, introduction and kind of semi-reviewed one page of... So I'm calling it six pages, even though, you know, anyway. <laughs> we definitely fell short of the target, but that's uh, that's par for the course. Um, okay, so into section 1.1, I'm going to say very little about section 1.1. I think y'all probably know all of this already, having taken a linear algebra class. A um, couple of quibbles I like to note. Um, the uh, the book uses bold to di- to distinguish a vector from a scalar. Um, I, you know, I guess it's fine, but I, it's frustrating to me because we can't write that very easily. If I wanted to write you know, V in bold, well, I have to kind of, you know, do like, uh, that is extremely slow if you're writing, if you're doing algebra, right? So I think it makes much more sense to uh, just put the little arrow over it. You say, you know, V, there you go with the little arrow. That little arrow is your reminder that this is a vector, not a scalar. So, anyway. Um, Cultural point, um, in advanced math classes, They'll just write V, and they won't put a little arrow or bolt. There won't be any visual cue that it's a vector. And the way you're supposed to know that it's a vector is because when it was defined several pages back, they said so. They said, let V be a vector, and then you're supposed to remember it. Um, So I think that's a little uh, tough. I I like seeing the visual reminder, uh, and it's pretty standard in introductory courses. Okay. Next thing, and again, this is just a notational quibble. Uh, Let's talk about uh, how would we describe this vector there. And um, one thing you can do is you can write that as P1, P2. Uh, The idea being that that is an indication that this starts at P1 uh, and ends at P2. Um, So I have kind of two complaints about this. Um, One is... If you instead write it as P2 minus P1, keeping in mind that P2 is not just a point, you can also think of it as being a vector. Because there's this um, uh, you know, one-to-one correspondence, a perfect pairing between points and vectors in Euclidean spaces. And then uh, likewise, uh, let's see here, uh, P1 is a vector. Then the alternative that you can write to represent what could be called P1, P2, is P2 minus P1, and this has the advantage of as it shows the algebra. There is an there is algebra happening in talking about that vector, and I like algebra. Algebra is a good thing, right? If there's algebra available to be understood, let's understand it is kind of my, my position. So I, I, I have a significant preference um, to, uh, to write it this way as opposed to... Uh, I'm, I'm going to... I'm not going to cross it out, but I'm going to put a frowny face on it. it, it it's fine, I suppose, but it, it, to me, it's just a missed opportunity. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. The other little quibble that I have about it um, is if you really mm, look carefully at what's written here, this suggests that the thing being described literally starts at P1 and literally ends at P2 as points. Here's the problem. This is a vector, not an arrow. Right? That vector is exactly the same as that and this and this. And none of these start or end at either P1 or P2. Right? So uh, calling it P1, P2 I, is a little bit misleading in the sense that it looks like you're describing the arrow, whereas usually... The actual intention is to talk about the vector itself, the the, uh, the abstraction of the vector. Okay. All right, how are we doing? What do you think? Everybody happy? Okay, that's all I have to say about uh, 1.1. So, boom. Uh, let's move on to 1.2. Again, there's a bunch of stuff in 1.2 that you've already seen. Um, uh, uh, make you know, uh, Read through it. Uh, make sure to refresh yourself <laughs> on uh, all that stuff. Uh, I am going to talk about the stuff that I think you very likely uh, either haven't seen or haven't seen enough of. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about parameterizations. Uh, these are very useful uh, algebraic constructions uh, to describe uh, curves, and we'll eventually see also surfaces. And the idea is it gives position 
as a function of, well, I'm going to say a single parameter, but that parameter is usually t. It doesn't have to be, but it's usually a t. Um, and uh, very often we think of that single parameter, at, uh, whoops, uh, that single parameter as being time. So think of a parameterization as being position as a function of time. And if you think about that, position changing as time changes, that's what drawing is, right? Is you uh, Drawing is the process of where you put your pen on the page and then you move your pen to different positions as time passes. It's literally drawing. Right? So I think it's a very nice way to think about what a parameterization is. <coughs> it's a representation of an act of drawing the curve. So here's an easy example. Um, uh, right here, notice we have um, uh, uh, both x and y are functions of t. Right, And if x and y are functions of t, then location, your position vector, namely x comma y, also a function of t. And uh, so this, you know, what we have written here, and again, you know, in terms of, you know, how you label it, you can either label it uh, either one of these ways is totally fine. Um, this represents the action of drawing a certain curve. Now, next natural question to ask, what curve is it, right? Um what is cosine t comma sine t? Here's where you have to kind of get clever. Uh, there is no single way to uh, that you always, you know, identify what the curve uh, drawn by a parameterization is. There's several different tools that might work depending on the circumstance, right? So um, one thing you can do, and what I've done here is observe that the formula for x, the formula for y, if you take these formulas and plug them into this equation, right? Plug in uh, x, plug in cosine t for everywhere you see a y, you put sine t. Notice that this equation always works, right? What that means is as you're drawing this curve, whatever this curve is, as you're drawing it, you never move off of the unit circle. So that means you're drawing the unit circle. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah, so this is a neat uh, neat trick, a uh, neat uh, approach that works sometimes. Now, of course, the, the rabbit out of a hat aspect of this is uh, where did this equation come from, right? That wasn't given. Uh, that's not part of the parameterization. I pulled it out of a hat. Why did I pull this out of a hat? Well, okay, I saw that I was looking at cosine and sine. I know I want an equation. I know that I want that equation to be satisfied by cosine and sine. What equations can I think of, right, that are satisfied by cosine and sine and uh, the Pythagorean identity, you know, pops to mind, right? So w we got lucky. We just happened to have a pre-existing, well-known relationship between these formulas. That will usually not happen, right? But when it does, hey, sometimes the fish jump in the boat. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, here's another one. Um, <clears throat> what is this? I'm going to show you two ways that you can figure out what this is. Um, first option, and again, this doesn't always work well. This is, but it, sometimes this is a useful method. First option is don't forget that's x, that's y, right? So the first thing I can do is uh, take the equation for x and solve for t, right? And then take that formula for t and plug it into there, like so, right? So you use the x equation to solve for t, then you plug that t into the y equation, and notice that as a result, what has come out is that y is equal to that Namely, said differently, I have an equation relating x and y. And uh, that uh, resolves the matter because, of course, you look at this and we instantly know, you know, flashbacks to high school algebra, but that's the equation of a line. And therefore, this is a parameterization of a line. What do you think? Everybody good? All right. 
Now, this works um, because uh, solving for t here was perfectly doable. Obviously, not always the case. I can write down some ugly, nasty formula of t where you literally cannot solve for t analytically. In which case, this is not a good method. Um, and I guess, let me take a quick aside and point out here, a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you all in this class is not um, necessarily going to work every time. right? I like to think that what I show you all in this class are uh, tools. And you should think of yourself as having a mental toolbox. <coughs> and these are tools that you can put into your toolbox. And sometimes a screwdriver is useful. For very specific tasks, screwdriver is indispensable. But uh, you would have a hard time hammering in a nail into a board with a screwdriver. And so you need to have multiple tools. They do different things. They're useful in different occasions. Okay, so this is one tool for your toolbox. Let me show you another one. Um, and this one, uh, you know, again, you know, it, it, uh, you had, things have to work out nicely for this to, for this to work. Uh, again, don't forget, there's X. There's Y. Right? And I'm just going to ask, you know, do you see any sort of a relationship uh, between these? I mean, do, do they look alike in certain ways? A very loose question here. Um, and I'm going to say roughly, yeah, they, they kind of, they're, they're obviously different. But they, they, they okay, they're both kind of, you know, uh, linear, uh, line-like, I'll say, functions of T. So they do seem to have something in common. When you notice this, when you notice that there is a, I feel like they look kind of alike, you can think in terms of how you would manipulate one into the other. And so I'm going to start with, here's what I know about X, right? And here's what I know about Y. And I'm going to just think in terms of what is the process I would have to do to turn t minus 1 into 3t plus 4. And, uh, you know, is there an easy sort of algebraic process that will sort of make that happen? And, yeah, sure, multiply both sides by 3. Um, add 7 to both sides. And then, sure enough, I have what I want. And whatever happened to x in that process of turning into y is your relationship between x and y. So, yeah, sometimes that's nice also. Um, and uh, so this second method, you could imagine, like, you know, imagine that uh, the uh, formula for x and the formula for y, imagine that maybe they're, uh, you know, degree 5 polynomials, where obviously you can't solve for t in either one. But you might be able to you, know, you might get lucky. Maybe the y nasty polynomial is exactly four times the x nasty polynomial. Then this worked great, and the top method fails miserably. Okay, how are we doing? Okay. All righty. Moving along. Let's talk about a three-dimensional parameterization. Um, this is another, uh, by hook or by crook, uh, do what you can. Here's, here's some ideas that are useful in this circumstance. Uh, let's understand this parameterization here. Um, this is, you'll notice first, uh, a three-dimensional thing, right? three coordinates. So we're parameterizing a curve in space. Um, curves in space don't really have equations. I mean, an equation in space would give you a surface. So if you want to describe a curve, it were, this, this is not going to result from finding the right equation. There isn't really a right equation. So here's a different take that you can, uh, that you can use. Uh, I'm going to first think about the projection to the xy plane. What, whatever this curve is going to end up being, and let's try to ignore the fact that I already have a picture of it here. Um, but uh, if I, whatever the curve is, if I were to just ignore z, throw it down into the xy plane, in other words, look only at the x and y coordinates, what is it? What is cosine t sine t? And well, reminder, we've seen it before. Right, that's a that's a that's a circle. That's the unit circle. It was our first example today. So, yeah, nice. How about that? That means I I understand uh, the projection down here into the x y plane. And let me uh, let me do it like this. I'm going to use the darker green. So whatever this curve is in space, its shadow down in the x y plane is just a circle, kind of going around counterclockwise, um, like that. 
That doesn't tell me what the curve is, but it's a lot of information. Now, let's naturally then, next thing, let's think about uh, what's the projection to the z-axis. Well, projection to the z-axis would mean I'm looking just at the z-coordinate and ignore x and y. What's happening there? Um, how would I describe uh, this um, this thing here? Well, t, at z equals t. That just means that my height is increasing at a constant rate. That's an e That's just sort of evident, right? So the projection to the z-axis is just moving up constant speed. So neither one of these by itself tells me what the curve is, but if you kind of put them together, you could probably persuade yourself that, all right, well, I, I'm going around in a circle like this, and all the while, I'm, my altitude is increasing at a constant rate, right? And it kind of suggests this picture that I've got here of a uh, of a uh, um, helix. Everybody see the argument there? Now this is very a hooker by crook, right? Um, I kind of pieced it together, um, and not all three dimensional curves are going to um, be resolved this way, but that's. Uh, these are these are tools that you can use, uh, and this is how you use those tools in this circumstance. Okay. All righty. By the way, uh, why did I start off by thinking about projection to the x y plane? Rhetorical question. What was my motivation there? Well, my motivation was I saw this and I was like, oh, I love that part, the cosine and sine. Yeah, I know that. That, that I know, so that motivates me to say, oh, ah, how can I focus on just this? Oh, that would be a projection down into the XY plane. Let's do that. Okay. If, uh, if I were to have thought, hey, let's project to the YZ plane, that would be weirder. I mean, doable, but, but, uh, definitely weirder. Alrighty. Okay. Now, we're gonna go backwards now. All the examples we saw previously, the parameterization was given, and the question was, what is the curve? Right, so we were going this way on all of these examples. Now, natural next question, what if you want to go the other way? What if you are given a curve, and the question is, how do I find a parameterization? So this is arguably uh, more important <laughs> in the sense that uh, you know very often in, when you look when you're solving a problem, very often you, what you know about the curve that you need to understand is uh, not exactly the algebra you wanted. It's not exactly uh, a parameterization. So this process of creating a parameterization out of uh, other information is uh, is a big deal. Something we need to be able to do. Uh, the process is called parametrizing, right? the act of creating a parameterization. So uh, again, tools for your toolbox. Um, some of these work sometimes. Right? Um, and uh, I'm, so I'm going to show them to you uh, in a mostly random order. Uh, I am going to start with my favorite one. Uh, this is the If you had to pick just a single parameterization method, I think I'd have to go with this one. Um, it's what I like to call the graph parameterization. Uh, the big idea is if, 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 big if, if you have a graph, and keep in mind what a graph is. A graph is an equation where one of the variables is solved for and written as a function of the others. We'll talk more about graphs a little bit later on, but for the moment that's all you need to know. Uh, graph uh, means one of the variables is a function of the others. Okay. If you have a graph, here's the big trick. It's shockingly convenient. The big trick is let t be the input variable. That's it. Just let t be the input variable. So, all right, well, let's see. My input variable here is, uh, is x. So I guess I'm going to let x equal to t. Following the instruction here, let x equal to t, and I claim everything else will just fall into place. Uh, so well, let's see, what else do I need to form a parameterization? To form a parameterization, I need to know y. Okay, how am I going to find y? Oh, well, y was the variable that was solved for. So y is, must be f of x, but wait a minute, x 
is t, and that means that y is f of t. <coughs> so specifically then, in this example, uh, we have y is x squared, and again, x is t, and that forces us to choose y equal to t squared. And we win, right? Victory. There's our parameterization. We have parameterized um, that graph. What do you think? Anybody see how this works out? And I, I'd like to, pers uh, to I, I, I'm going to appeal to your sense of pattern here that this is always going to work. That if you have a graph, it's got to be a graph. It's, you see how that's critical. You have to have one of the variables solved for as a function of the other in order for uh, for that for this to work. But if you have a graph, you win. This will parameterize your curve. Okay. All righty. Um, here's another one. Now, this equation is not written as a graph. I have not... Um, I don't have one of the variables written as a function of the others, so there's a temptation to look at this and think, oh, this, this, uh, okay, I guess I can't use the graph parameterization. Not so. It's just not <coughs> currently written as a graph, but it still is, right? You can just solve for that x, nothing to it. In this case, again, you know, doesn't always work, but in this case, you can solve for x. So this equation here, was a sneaky hidden graph, right? And so I encourage you to always be on the lookout for that kind of thing. So here, it is a graph. Now I'm going to play the same game as we did on the previous page. The input variable, in this case, is y. That input variable, following the rules, the input variable is t. And plugging in t in for that input variable causes x be that. What do you say? Everybody's good? Okay. Good deal. All righty. All right, now, here's a fun example. Um, this is something y'all might be able to uh, relate to uh, visually, you know, outside of class. Um, this is the, uh, what I like to call the bicycle wheel reflector uh, example. And so imagine that you have a bicycle wheel and uh, you're driving along the road, somebody else, maybe not you, somebody else is driving down the road on a uh, bicycle, and there's a reflector that's attached, uh, and just for the sake of this example, I'm going to say the reflector is attached, uh, you know, basically right at the edge of the wheel, and it's not really real, but anyway, just for the purposes of an example. As this bicycle starts to move, right, as the wheel starts to roll and the bicycle heads off uh, like that, um, I'm sure you've probably seen this at some point in the past, but it makes a kind of a kind of a uh, shape kind of like that. Everybody feel like you've seen that at some point? You know, nighttime, street lights, and um, uh, the, the you get this weird pattern on the reflector. Okay. All right, so this curve, the path of the reflector, that's what we want to parameterize. And uh, it's it's tricky. It's a weird curve. It's it's uh, very hard to write an equation for this curve. Uh, in fact, I think it may be analytically infeasible, unfeasible. Anyway, you can't, it's not feasible analytically um, to uh, to write an equation for it. So what are we going to do? Um, it, there's a great method here for parameterizing things like this. Uh, use vector algebra. Now again, tool for your toolbox. This won't always work, but this is a fantastic tool in the toolbox, and that is to observe that this reflector, right, as it's moving along, the reflector is the sum of simpler things. It's a sum of this point, the axle, Axles don't do anything interesting at all. Axles move in a straight line. That's easy. I mean, details to be worked out, but we're not scared of parameterizing that straight line path that the axle follows, right? Uh, and then plus this vector, what I'm calling D, uh, which is 
uh, the uh, well D for you know the difference between where the reflector is and where the the axle is, and of course it's as the wheel goes, it's going around in a circle. Um, now, it, you know, don't make the mistake of uh, thinking that that vector is doing something more complicated uh, like this. It's not really the point. Uh, we're not interested in the arrow. We're interested in the vector, and the vector here uh, that I have in green there. This vector is this exact same as uh, that, and as the bicycle rolls down the road, that just moves around in a circle. How are we doing? Everybody on board? So this weird, weird, weird curve is kind of, in a way, line plus circle, and that's uh, much easier to, uh, to to deal with. So what we need to do now is figure out how to parametrize the axle, how to parametrize that D vector, and then we'll literally just add them up. Okay. All right. Now, when you're parametrizing, again, you have to have a parameter. The parameter, yeah, usually you don't have to, but yeah, very often it's convenient to use T. Um, so we've got to decide what T is going to be in this example. Uh, notice that in the statement of the question, uh, uh, here you go, statement of the question, there is no statement about what the parameter is or it needs to be. What role, where do we see the parameter in this example not given? So this is a choice. Um, there are different things that you could choose. I'm going to choose uh, this angle here as I have it drawn in the picture. Um, the reason for this is that, uh, well, it's zero when we start and it increases as the wheel rolls. And so, you know, it kind of is playing the role of that uh, equivalent similar anyway to the role that time is playing. Time, you like to think of as starting at zero and increasing as, you know, as time passes. <laughs> right? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So, reasonable choice. All right. Okay. So, let's start with the axle. How are we going to understand the axle? The axle's location. Um... Uh, first part is pretty straightforward, uh, and that is the uh, the height. Uh, let's see here. So the height here, the y coordinate, I think is pretty easily seen. The y coordinate's just a because uh, the height doesn't change. The axle stays put height wise. Does everybody believe that? Okay. Uh, next part of the question: What is the x coordinate? So I want to know. Given the parameter value of t, what is the x coordinate of the axle? Now, I, I appeal to your sense of geometry. The x coordinate of the axle is that distance. <coughs> and now here's the real insight uh, of intuition. That distance is the amount of road that has touched rubber. And I again, intuitive appeal. On a dry road, the amount of road that has touched rubber is the same as the amount of rubber that has touched road. Otherwise, it'd be slipping, and hopefully bicycle tires don't slip. Is it, what do you think? Is that intuitive? Okay. So this is a big insight. This is the foot in the door. Um, so what it helps us to understand is that if I want to understand that x-coordinate, right? I'm interested in x, a.k.a. I'm interested in the amount of road I can reconceive of that as being the amount of rubber. I just need to know the arc length, in other words, of that uh, piece of circle. And uh, arc length of a circle of a known radius, old geometry problem, there you go, a radius times angle, and so AT. Everybody all right with that? Okay, okay let's see here. Now, next question, we're going to move on. I think I'm going to switch over to using the pencil. Uh, we're interested now in this vector, D, which goes around in a circle. Again, we're not interested in the location of the arrow. Whoa, whoa. We're interested in the uh, vector itself. The vector, I'm going to, for convenience sake, I'm going to think of it in standard position because it doesn't matter. Um, and I can then describe the vector by the location of the head because the tail is at the origin. Right. So... 
How can I describe that location? Well, the first thing you're going to notice is uh, that head describing this vector, that head's on my circle of radius A. And a circle of a radius A is easy to understand. That, that location, uh, here I should do it, uh, I should make the same color choice. That location of that head, if you're on a circle of a known radius, then uh, you just understand it in terms of the angle theta, and it's A cosine theta, A sine theta. Again, it's old news. Um, so uh, that's the location of D, a.k.a. that's the vector, the difference vector that we'll be adding to the axle in a moment. Problem, uh, I've got it written in terms of the wrong parameter. I've got it written in terms of theta. Theta is not the same as T, right? Very importantly, T, uh, and you can see it right here in the initial picture, T is that angle, Whereas theta, uh, the angle measured off of the positive part of the x-axis as we do, is that angle. Not the same. But easily related, right? Not at all hard to see that uh, those two angles always add up to 3 pi over 2. So I can solve for theta. I can take that formula for theta. Um, Plug it into there. Use some angle addition formulas. By the way, do you all remember your angle addition formulas? I know high school trig was a long time ago. Um, but uh, they're really handy. Angle addition formulas. I encourage you to remind yourself of those angle addition formulas for sine and cosine. Just sine and cosine. Don't bother with tangent or secant or anything. That's weird. But uh, sine and cosine angle addition formulas, everybody should know. Uh, so uh, make sure to refresh yourself on that. And that turns this vector formula for D into that. What do you think? Everybody all right? Okay, so let's put it all together then. The whole story. Um, uh, we were going to understand the, pra uh, oh, yeah, okay, the parameterization. We we're going to understand that uh, as being a sum of the axle location, which we solved for there, uh, plus this D vector location, which we solved for here. And uh, A plus D, blue plus green, is that. And so we win. How are we doing? Everybody see how that worked? So fundamentally, the, the, the you know deep down underneath it all, yeah, there's a bunch of details you gotta you know understand how rubber and road works and uh, make you know make gotta remember those angle addition formulas, blah 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 details. But the the very first thing that we did is we broke down a hard to understand thing, namely the purple point, as being a sum of much easier to understand things. Um, and you know blue is easy to understand, green is easy. Well, tractable, right? The reason. I'm, they're both a little tricky, but uh, but we can reasonably understand the blue point. We can reasonably understand the green vector. So that's a that's a real neat trick. And uh, you know, does this parameterize all curves? No, of course not. This is a tool for your toolbox, but it's a neat trick um, and very useful in some cases. Okay. All right, moving along. Um, lines. Um. <clears throat> Lines can be described in a lot of ways. Um, if it should happen to be the case that you know a point on the line, namely a point that the line passes through, and if you have a vector parallel to the line, like so. Um, first of all, note that this information... I'm looking for a line that goes through the following point and that's parallel to the po following vector. That uniquely characterizes the line. There is exactly one line um, that goes through a certain point and is parallel to a certain vector. Uh, so this is enough information to describe the line. And uh, in particular, though, if I want to uh, if I want to write down a formula for some point on that line, a pretty easy way to do it is to say that uh, well, uh, if I were to just start at my given point. 
and then I'm going to take my given vector v and I'm okay well I'm going to need to scale it apparently uh, I need something that might be longer or shorter or possibly back the other direction but I need a scalar multiple of that v um, to add to my given point um, then uh, you know green plus dark blue gives me a new point on the line so at, and then again notice how it has turned out here son of a gun I've got X I've got position as a function of a parameter which I of course saw it coming I saw it, I labeled that parameter as T that scalar factor uh, and so I've got position as a function of time parameterization everybody on board with that one All right. Okay, here's another one. Uh, notice, by the way, all of the examples that I'm showing you here, I'm using different tools in all of these examples because, again, my goal here is to show you the tools. The examples themselves, eh, I don't know how important these examples are, but they, uh, but they help. Uh, their job is to give me an excuse to demonstrate the tools. So uh, what I am actually doing here is showing you a bunch of different tools. Okay, here's another tool. Oh, yeah, question. Yeah, about the previous thing. Yep. Why do we multiply t with the vector rather than the x dot? Well, yeah, okay. No, I, I hear you. That's a good question. Uh, so keep in mind, um, y you have to interpret points and vectors appropriately. right? So if I'm thinking of x as being a point, fine, it's a point, but um, points, you can't, you don't really multiply points times scalars. Points have a location. What would it mean to multiply? What is five times New York? I don't know what that means. You see what I'm saying? Right, so uh, we multiply scalars times vectors. So I need to reconceive of x as a vector, x naught, excuse me, uh, before I ask what does it mean to multiply it by a scalar. And now understanding x naught as a vector, if I were to multiply x naught by uh, some scalar, well, I'd, that'd take me over to here, and I, I just have no desire to go over there. Does that make is that yeah. cool? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? That's a great question. Thank you. Everybody's happy. Okay. So is the end result also a point? Uh, yeah, well, the end result, I mean, it, it, so keep in mind, you know, when you're in Euclidean space, all points can be thought of as vectors. All vectors can be thought of as points. We have this canonical, uh, you know, uh, put the tail at the origin uh, relationship there, right? So you can interpret however you want. Now, um, I find it convenient to think of this as being a point because I'm imagining the process of drawing this line and one of my pencil moves across the paper, I think of where the pencil is as being a location. Right, uh, I don't think of it as being a magnitude and a direction. You know, I don't think of it as an arrow. Um, but if you really wanted to, you could say, okay, I have the point. Here's my formula for x, and I, you know what? I'm going to reconceive of that as a vector, and totally fine. Yeah. So rather than thinking of this formula here as drawing the line like that, you could, I suppose, think of it as doing this. that. Is that cool? Everybody happy? Okay. Alrighty. Okay, next example. Um, sometimes you have an existing parameterization that you can just tweak a little bit and it gives you what you want. And again, circumstances, right? This doesn't always work. It's tool for your toolbox, all that. Okay, so in this case, uh, we want to parameterize, the question we're being asked here is to parameterize this ellipse with that equation. How am I going to parameterize that ellipse? Um, I'm going to assume here a fact of geometry that I hope y'all are comfortable with, um, willing to believe anyway, um, and that is that when you stretch a circle, you get an ellipse. Right? Um, so this thing that I want to parameterize, well, it's an ellipse, okay, aka it is a stretched out circle. And the thing is, I have an existing parameterization of a circle already. Right, we already know cosine t, sine t parameterizes a circle. So um, I have a parameterization of a circle, 
What I want is a parameterization of whatever I get when I stretch that out. All right, well, so here, here we go. Let's stretch it out. There's my circle parameterization. And you can see I'm gonna need to stretch it by a factor of three in the x direction. So there you go. Let's just multiply all the x coordinates by three. That stretches by a factor of three in the x direction. And then let's see here. I'm going to need to stretch by a factor of two, apparently, in the y direction. Uh, so stretching by a factor of two in the y direction. Eh, we'll just multiply the y coordinates by two. Boom. We win. Right. So um, sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes uh, you can. Sometimes the thing you're interested in is logically very close by something that you already have. And so you can take advantage of that. Everybody all right? Okay. 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 All right. Now I want to uh, talk about um, some kind of abstractions a little bit before we do the next example. Um, when a lot of people, when they look at a parameterization, what they really see is, ah, it's a bunch of algebra that describes a curve. And then when they look at a an equation, they see, hey, well, it's a bunch of algebra that describes a curve. The parameterizations and equations at a naive glance <laughs> look very similar. They're algebra describing a curve, right? It's a very important thing, though, to distinguish uh, how they describe the curve in very different ways. Uh, so a parameterization, whoops, got my colors backwards. Uh, a parameterization, and let me do it like this, I'll do the box. A parameterization, what it does explicitly is it takes a um, uh, an arbitrary parameter as its input, and then what comes out is location, right? Location is a function of time. So what comes out then is a point on the curve. So a parameterization is a function and arbitrary parameter goes in, point on the curve comes out. That very, very importantly is absolutely not what an equation is. An equation describes a curve in a very different way. An equation uh, well, you plug a point in that may or may not be on the curve, and the equation either works or doesn't work, right? Equations are either true or false. Again, keep in mind, equations are statements, right? X squared plus Y squared equals 1. That is a statement. Might be true, might not be true, but it itself is just a statement. So the point goes in, and then what comes out is an answer of, uh, well, either yes or no, thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, so so uh, keep in mind, they're, they're really, really different things. The way I like to uh, phrase it just, for, you know, kind of casually is that parameterizations are point generators and equations are point testers. So we're doing very, very different things to points. We're either making them or we're testing them not the same. Now, before I go on in the next example, is everybody comfortable with this? Does everybody see what I'm talking about here? Um, and does everybody see what I mean when I say it's very important to, to distinguish these? These are these are different roles that these two pieces of algebra are doing. Okay. All right. So uh, this point of view, I think, is really helpful in answering this question. Um, question is, uh, I've got a parametric curve. And um, I want to know what points on that curve are also on this plane. Or said differently, where does this curve intersect this plane? Um, and so here's here's the, the, the thought process I suggest. Uh, you look at this and you say, all right, well, I'm, I'm generating points on the curve. And then I have a means of testing whether a given point is on the plane. So how about this? How about how about we generate <laughs> some points that are definitely therefore on the curve and then those exact points let's then test them to see if those points are also on the plane. So we're going to generate points and then test them. And uh, that's what I've got in this uh, algebra down here. Um, so um, 
Here's the points that I'm generating. Right, that makes these points. I've got formulas for x, y, and z. These points here, definitely on the curve. That They came out of the point generator that defines the curve. Definitely on the curve. Now we ask the question, are they on the plane? And again, we do what equations do. We plug points into the equation and see if the equation works or not. So I'm literally plugging in these formulas for x, y, and z. x, y, and z. I'm going to toss right in there. And now we get to see if that equation works or not. And at this point, we're just solving an equation. Um, so uh, now let's uh, see how that fleshes out. Uh, we, uh, this bit of algebra that we have here, of course, you can multiply, you know, simplify, collect terms, etc. That algebra turns out to be this. And I, I got to tell you, this is a pretty easy, uh, pretty easy test to, to answer. Is t squared minus one equal to zero? Well, usually no. Sometimes yes. Right? These are the times that t squared minus 1 is equal to 0. So said differently, these are the values of t that generate points that, that are therefore also on the plane. So there, these are the values of t that generate uh, the points I'm actually interested in. So you take t equals plus or minus 1 and then plug those into your parameterization and that will give you the correct values of x, y, and z. Everybody see how that worked? Questions? Feel free. Everybody's happy. All right. Okay. Uh, this will probably be our last thing here uh, for today. Um, so... Suppose you have a line in R3. We've talked about lines in R3 and how uh, you, you can parameterize a curve in R3, but you can't really... I mean, it's not that you can't, but it's it, it's not natural. It's weird and undesired. It, it, effectively, it's not a good option to try to make an equation for a curve in space. Because equations tend to make surfaces. So, uh, but uh, what if I want a point tester? Right. Well, I mean, an equation would have been a point tester for a line in R3, but uh, I, I, for whatever reason, if I might need a point tester, how do you make a point tester? I can't just use an equation. So here's the idea. Um, you start with your parameterization, right? And I, I'm going to uh, clunkily create a point tester. Here's a bad point tester. Uh, how would I test whether a given x, y, z is on this line? Well, if there's a value of t for which this works, then yes, that's on the line. <laughs> so, so I say this is a bad point tester because I'm, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, if you come to me with a point, if it's possible to generate it with my point generator, then yes, it's on the line. It, but how do I know if it's possible? Right, so this is a this is a bad test, but we're going to improve it in just a moment. Yeah, sorry. Uh, could you explain the symbols around? Y yes, thank you. Um, I, I always need to to uh, do that. Um, this, this is all fairly standard mathematical shorthand. Uh, this uh, says uh, there is uh, or there exists something along those lines, and uh, this little symbol here uh, means uh, such that or so that. Ooh, what's my there we go. Um, <coughs> such that. So this statement here then reads, there exists a value of t such that this uh, parameterization uh, makes the point x, y, z. Okay. All right. So the way we're going to manipulate uh, this bad tester is uh, to do a little bit of algebra, uh, I'm going to take each one of these three equations and I'm going to solve for t in each of those three equations. Easy algebra, no, no sweat, right? Solve for t. Having done that, now let's ask, what does this say? This says there's a value of t that is simultaneously equal to this, this, and this. 
How could there be, how could there possibly be a value of t that's equal to all three of these things? You can't have t equaling three different things. Oh wait, oh, ah, but you can if they're all equal to each other. But you see, that's the only way. That the only way that you can have a value of t that's equal to all three of those things is if all three of those things are equal to each other. And if indeed all three of those things are equal to each other, then, well, then, yeah, that whatever that thing is that all three of those things are equal to, that's what the t is. That's equal to all three of those things. Does that make sense? Um, so, uh, so anyway, the point is, uh, this is the test. Uh, and you see, this is a point tester. It's not an equation. It's two equations. Or depending on how you look at it, arguably I also need that to equal to that. Kind of follows automatically from the first two. But you can, if you want to, you can think of this as three equations. And geometrically, that's actually fairly natural. Um, so anyway, these are called the symmetric equations. Um, for the line, uh, the real nice little bit of algebra. This process that I've showed you is the is how you uh, turn a parameterization into symmetric equations. If you want to go the other way, no sweat. If you want to take symmetric equations and turn that into a parameterization, just don't forget the whole point to these things equaling each other is so that they can all equal to t, and then just go the other way. There's your parameterization. So, easy translation. Now, I'm out of time, uh, so we'll call it a day. We're calling it a week. Uh, oh, look at that. We just finished section 1.2. How nice. Um, and uh, y'all have a great weekend. See you on Monday. Thank you.